I especially want to acknowledge the Deputy Mayor for Public Safety and Justice, Deputy Mayor Lindsay Apia, and the Acting Police Chief, Pamela Smith. Uh, you've heard me uh, brief and speak many times on public safety and how ensuring the safety of our city is our first priority uh, in working hand in hand with policymakers and community uh, to ensure that we are doing everything possible to make our community safe. Uh, and to that end, uh, today I'm announcing new legislation uh, that will address recent crime trends and give law enforcement more tools to hold criminals accountable and keep our neighborhoods safe. The Addressing Crime Trends Now Act will create an environment that better supports communities and victims as well as MPD's ability to hire and retain qualified officers. And some of the changes are just plain common sense. We know, for example, that the criminal behavior directed at our business community, particularly our retailers, is unacceptable. And people in our city are sick and tired of it. People want great businesses in their neighborhoods. They want to go to stores and restaurants and they don't want to have to worry about those businesses being robbed repeatedly and brazenly. Yes. So with this legislation, we are creating criminal penalties and establishing a new crime directed towards organized retail theft in our city. And under the new law, it will be illegal for any person to organize a theft for profit scheme by recruiting or directing other individuals to commit organized retail theft. We are also reinstating the law that makes it unlawful to wear a mask for the purpose of committing criminal acts or threatening people or causing fear. Obviously, our community's relationship around wearing masks has changed significantly since 2020, and thank God for that. But we've all seen the videos. In fact, there was one from the wharf last Monday where everyone who jumped out of a car with a gun pointed at an innocent person had on a ski mask. And we need to address that. These changes, of course, won't apply to people who are wearing masks for their health. And one thing that you've heard from Chief Smith and her team frequently out in the community, they're out over the last several months, have visited neighborhoods across our city, and there has been overwhelming support for addressing open air drug dealing and loitering. People in the community are not fools. They know what's happening at some of these sites. And the new legislation will allow MPD to limit loitering by reinstating the ability for the police chief to declare a drug-free zone for up to 120 hours to disrupt and prohibit people from congregating on public space for the purchase, sale, or use of illegal drugs. The establishment of a temporary drug-free zone will allow MPD and community members to work together to interrupt illegal activity and allow neighborhoods to reclaim our space. And finally, uh, Chief Smith will go over the next part in more detail, but I want to start by saying this. MPD continues to be a leader in fair and constitutional policing across this nation. They continue to work every day to have and keep the trust of our city. And this legislation won't change that. It will, however, support the department in dealing with some of the, comp the negative consequences of the Comprehensive Police Adjustment and Justice Amendment Act. Some of the changes that were made just don't match the daily practice of safe and effective policing. 
and whether that's around incidental contact you can make with a person or how officers can use their body-worn camera footage to write reports or whether police are allowed to safely chase a criminal who's right in front of them. And you've heard me say repeatedly this year, we must have a policy environment that supports accountability, whether it's from school safety leaders, advisory neighborhood commissioners, or in conversations with residents. And residents have expressed loud and clear to me in every venue you can imagine across this city that they are looking for solutions to help fill the gaps in our public safety ecosystem. We promise to leave no stone unturned, but we need to act now, and we need to send the strong message that violence is not acceptable in our city, and this perception that people have that you can commit a brazen crime and get away with it has got to stop. This legislation will help change that. And I want to thank our officers. We should give a hand to the hardworking men and women of the Metropolitan Police Department. We want to give a hand to the leadership. We want to recognize our 911 call takers who are taking your calls and helping to get police on the way. We want to thank our fire and emergency management officials. We want to recognize the prosecutors and the public defenders who help make our system work. We want to acknowledge the, and thank the judges, but we also want them to see us and hear us and let them know we want to be safe. And so, as I mentioned, there's a lot of work to do. There's not one tool that is the magic wand but we have to investigate and press down on all of our tools and make sure we're doing everything that we can from the enforcement side, which is what we're here to talk about today, but we talk every day also about the prevention side and the opportunity side. And you should be proud in your city that we give people one chance, two chances, three chances, but your chances can affect my safety. And that's what we're here to talk about. We want everybody to take advantage of the opportunities available in our great city. And we want to be safe. So with that, I want to acknowledge our Deputy Mayor for Public Safety and Justice, Deputy Mayor Lindsay Apia, followed by Chief Pamela Smith, currently the Acting Chief, and we need to get our chief confirmed, right? Yeah. Yeah. Let's get our chief confirmed. And then we'll have um, some time for questions. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. I'm Lindsay Apia. I'm privileged to serve as the Deputy Mayor for Public Safety and Justice for the district. Our public safety and justice ecosystem, it's unique because of the district's criminal justice system structure, one that's a mix of local, federal, and independent agencies most of which are not under the authority of the mayor. And so what we need from all of our colleagues across our local and federal and independent is for them to match the commitment that we have in district government to not just combating crime, but to our approach to the work with the belief that we can prevent the next crime, that we can prevent someone else from being a victim. From Mayor Bowser to every dedicated employee in district government, we are simply committed to working with our community and government partners every day to make the city safer. Mayor Bowser is putting every necessary resource towards public safety and turning these trends around. The mayor has maintained, and you heard her say today, we must have a policy environment that supports appropriate accountability. And her addressing crime trends now, act now, act demonstrates what our community, you all are telling us. We want appropriate accountability for those who choose to commit crime and inflict fear in our neighborhoods. In the district, we're leaders in systemic reform. That is certainly true in criminal justice space, where we lead in pushing the bounds of what is possible to achieve equal justice for all under the law. We can and we should be proud of our progress, but we must never be so proud that we're unwilling to critically evaluate our reforms and adjust when unintended consequences are leading to har harmful outcomes for those we serve. While we're a city that often leads the nation in instituting forward-thinking reforms, we must never lose sight that we are first and foremost a local city. 
and that our solutions must be tailored to the specific realities that we're facing here. Act Now clarifies and updates several um, existing policies to better align with the day-to-day -day realities of safe and effective policing. And so I'm going to now turn it over to Chief Smith to talk more about some of those proposals. Hello, everyone, and I'm Acting Chief Pamela Smith of the Metropolitan Police Department here in Washington, D.C., and thank you for joining us today. I would like to begin by thanking Mayor Muriel Bowser and Deputy Mayor Lindsay Appear for introducing this legislation. I'm honored to stand here today to speak with you about legislation that will help how we, as the Metropolitan Police Department, better serve our communities. This legislation is impactful because it clarifies the many challenges our law enforcement professionals face today. While all of these provisions are highly important, there are six key provisions listed in the bill that I would like to expand on just a little bit. It will be our vehicle pursuit policy, reestablishing drug-free zones, while, which will help limit loitering, new legislation for organized retail theft, clarifying language regarding incidental contact with the neck and modifications of officer discipline and ensuring that our officers can review the body-worn camera prior to writing their initial report. Allow me to speak about these in greater detail. Vehicle pursuits. When the Comprehensive Policing and Justice Amendment Act went into effect in April of 2023, MPD immediately began to experience the effects of the legislation which banned pursuits in all cases. Working with the mayor's office and the council, this summer an emergency clarification amendment was passed which clarified some cases where pursuits could occur. This legislation includes those clarifications. Make no mistake, the Metropolitan Police Department recognizes the potential harms of vehicle pursuits, but our officers must have the limited ability to pursue in the most violent cases to ensure that we keep our communities safe. Anti loitering drug free zones. Residents, let me say this again, and I've been out in many communities. Residents have very real complaints about drug transactions that they are witnessing in public space. This legislation will return a practice that has been determined to be constitutional by re establishing drug free zones. This serves as another tool for our Metropolitan Police Department to address drug-related crime on our district streets and protect the public from the dangers that are often reasonable and associated with sales, purchase, and the use of illegal drugs. Organized retail theft. We continue, continue to hear from our business community that organized retail theft is a problem which can impact revenue but also impacts our job communities. And this legislation gives the Metropolitan Police Department the ability to address organized retail theft. Specifically, this legislation gives officers another tool to hold folks accountable who make concerted effort to thieve for profit and or directing others to do so. We uphold, and I'm going to be clear about this, we uphold the district's values and we underscore that this type of behavior is, no, is not tolerated here in the district. Similar to clarifications necessary on vehicle pursuits, this legislation seeks clarification language related to neck restraints and asphyxiating restraints, specifically clarifying incidental contact versus an actual neck restraint. MPD has long restricted neck restraints that would cause an individual's inability to breathe. These policy restrictions go back decades, and I fully support these restrictions. The provisions in this legislation, excuse me, the provisions in the recently constructed legislation, the Com Comprehensive Policing and Justi Justice Amendment Act, are overly broad and jeopardizes our public safety. As we have experienced since the effect of the amendment, this spring, the combination of the words intent or effect with the assertion of the word movement has created numerous situations where officers were engaged with armed individuals, individuals attempting self-harm, or similar and due to incidental contact and volatile situations were in violation of our current policy as written. While codifying the restrictions may have been well intended, they have the unintended consequences of potentially escalating the severity of the force that is used. 
and it creates situations where our officers are kind of hesitant to go hands-on to apprehend an individual when it is appropriate. It has created circumstances where officers' credibility has been called into question due to incidental contact. I want to be clear. The Metropolitan Police Department has and will continue to prohibit what we think the public thinks of as a neck restraint. But this legislation clarifies language to address concerns of incidental contact by our officers. This legislation maintains the restrictions that are necessary to potentially harm the public. We're also talking about the modifications to officer discipline to maintain transparency, but also allows for privacy rights to be protected. This legislation introduces well-needed revisions to our officer discipline standards to ensure the officers, number one, continue to be held accountable and provide public transparency around discipline, but it also provides them privacy protection that is afforded to every other government DC employee. And finally, the body-worn camera review prior to writing reports. This legislation aligns our body-worn camera policies with nationwide best practices and recommendations from the U.S. Department of Justice and the United States Office of Attorney here in the District of Columbia. Currently, due to the restriction in current law, an officer is not able to review their body-worn camera prior to making an initial report. While this makes sense in cases involving a police officer involved shooting or serious use of force, for most calls police officers respond to, the body-worn camera is an important tool to document what was observed and what occurred. And we need our officers to be able to utilize this tool to the fullest extent. This new legislation allows our officers the ability to provide the most accurate police reports possible. And being able to view their camera footage to recall relevant details from the scene is important, not only for our department, but it's also important for the United States Attorney's Office when they are prosecuting cases. This recommendation is also supported by our United States Attorney's Office and mirrors national best practices recommendations. I want to again thank Mayor Bowser for her continued support of public safety here in the District of Columbia and her tireless effort and work to submit to council legislation that will help the Metropolitan Police Department to better serve the communities that you live in and the communities that we live in. Thank you. Okay, I want to ask the Chief and Deputy Mayor and City Administrator Donahue uh, to join me. Uh, we'll take a uh, we'll take some press questions and we'll may have time for community questions. Yes, please introduce yourself as you speak. Uh, it's Renee Phil with Axios, Madam Mayor. It's probably been a very long time since DC leaders talked about open air drug markets so specifically. Can someone talk about how many suspects there are in DC? What's exactly being sold illegally now and what areas might be targeted if this were to become law? Let me ask the chief to respond. And so as most of you know, we have been um, conducting um, multi-agency um, initiatives across the District of Columbia. And in that process, we have a three-day approach where there are certain areas across the district based off of data where we recognize that. And then our, and our community members have also shared with us that there's, there's significant drug transaction. On day one, we will go out and we will determine uh, we sent our, our criminal investigators, our detectives out in those areas to really take a good look at the types of drugs that are in those areas. We make effective recs, arrests. Day two, we come back and we bring in an all DC government approach to really take a look at those areas. And then what we'll do is day three, we do what's called a celebration. I'm sure some of you have participated in, that, in those areas. So there are quite a few areas across the District of Columbia where we um, intentionally will focus on, where we recognize that there is um, open air drug markets specifically related on the data that we currently have. I don't want to forecast where we will go uh, because we have to create plans to make sure that we not only keep the community safe but also keep our officers safe. And as I come up, I should acknowledge that uh, we've been joined by Council Member Kenyon McDuffie at large. Uh, thank you, Council Member, Council Member Anita Bonds at large, and Ward 4 Council Men, uh, Member Lewis George. Uh, next question. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor. Uh, can you talk about your reversal on a 
closing the drug-free market from years ago to now, and why the change of heart here? My what? My what? You, you're, you, 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 you uh, repealed the drug-free zones in 2014. What, why now? Why bring this back into play? And thank you for that question, um, because as I recall, I think that was the year that um, my last year on the council and a measure moved from Council Member Grasso that joined prostitution-free zones and drug-free zones, if my memory serves me correct. Uh, and that bill uh, was, I, I supported that bill. Uh, and the question that was previously asked is accurate. Uh, we see, and part of the reason why you hear that we call this bill addressing crime uh, trends now is that we want to blunt a trend that we see in more open air drug dealing uh, that we have pretty much squelched in the city, save for, I would say, a handful, but certainly less than 10. Uh, and we don't want that activity to proliferate. Uh, this this law, uh, the drug free school, uh, uh, drug free zones was in place. How long did you tell me, Deputy Mayor? From 1996 to 2014 uh, in the district, and we think uh, that we want it. We want the police to have the tool. I, I want to kind of set some expectations uh, that the, the the police chiefs will deploy uh, and use the tool uh, using the officers that are available to us and she will prioritize it uh, for the best interest of public safety. Uh, so no one should think that there will be you know, 20 drug-free zones being implemented at the same time, um, but this is a tool that the chief would have. Um, I press questions first, yes, yes, yes. What part of Act Now do you think best will address uh, gun violence all of Act Now and all of Safer Stronger. So, uh, as you know, we introduced a bill um, in the early, uh, late spring, early summer, uh, that included uh, many provisions that we think will make the city safer, including addressing uh, gun crime uh, and gun penalties. And so, all of that is important. But the things that um, we're introducing uh, today address the, the six pillars that the chief mentioned that are gonna help us address emerging trends and retail draft, death and open air drug dealing, but also prohibiting, uh, reinstating the prohibition on ski masks. Yes, Mark. Or they need to get permission from a, a commander before engaging. Well, and I have a follow-up to that. Okay. Um, so, so when it comes to vehicle pursuit, it, it must the the threshold for that is that the the officer must be able to witness that there is an imminent threat to public safety. Um, he or she can use their own discretion in determining what that is. However, we do have this strict, very, very strict policy that dictates when, where, looking at the, 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 the factors, whether there are large crowds uh, when we pursue um, vehicles. And, and, and keeping in mind, it has to be an imminent threat of criminal activity that, that is afoot. And, and being able to apprehend those suspects within a reasonable amount of time. And I, and I say reasonable amount of time because we want to look at we want to take into consideration the elements that are around a particular situation, uh, making sure we're not in a, a school zone and, and places like that to ensure that the public stays safe. Um, that is the officer's discretion, as I stated. However, with supervisory, close supervision from the supervisor. Can you give us a specific example? So we saw in the video recently of a, of a vehicle that struck a family in a crosswalk. There was a police officer just seconds after that on the scene, um, initiated what looked like he was going to go after the car, and he came back and said he wasn't allowed to pursue. In that instance, would that officer, if this legislation was in place, would that officer have been allowed to pursue that vehicle and try to apprehend that person? As much as I would like to answer that question, I can't speak to it because I don't know exactly what you're talking about. Um, I think we do have, in, in the legislation that was passed this summer the, in the, within the emergency bill, gives officers a little latitude to be able to pursue vehicles when there's an imminent threat. And again, I can't answer, answer that particular um, question. Yes, sir. On, on the, um, the 
strength, and that's the case here. You were kind enough to give us a, what I thought was a very helpful demonstration of what would not be allowed as far as a circle and what would be allowed as far as a net in, in put, putting a stand on something or touch on something. So could you give us that, that demonstration again to the public? Like well, I, I wouldn't be able to do it right now. We can certainly do it off camera. <laughs> We will certainly be able to do it off camera. Oh, I'm sorry. Do it off camera. And we can also direct you to the link on our website um, where, where our community briefings are, that we publish those use of force um, specifically related to neck restraints and other use of force um, on our website. I, I will not get, when I gave it to you, it was off camera. And I will re defer to um, certainly willing to demonstrate, but not on camera. Mark. We have actual examples, so we don't have to make up an example here because we have actual examples. And we put them up, and we put them up in our community briefing so you can see exactly what the police are dealing with um, and talking about. Yes? Can you tell us, bring us up to date on the hiring and retiring of police officers right now? It's getting any better, worse, steady, each year? Yep. Good morning, thank you for that, for that question. Um, so I, I say that um, we're getting better when it comes to hiring. Um, um, I've been in this seat since July um, 17, 2021. Um, in August, I'm sorry, 2023, Woo, did I go back? <laughs> my, my bad. Yeah. Um, um, so um, we've had 21 officers, um, uh, recruit officers in our August class. Our September class, we had 21, and today I'm happy to announce this morning at 7 a.m., we have 23 new officers that have been recruited for the Metropolitan Police Department. I have also stood up, established a recruitment team, a very diverse recruitment team that will focus specifically on recruiting officers for the Metropolitan Police Department. Okay, in the press suit, Yadelia. Um, first question for the chief. I have two questions. I know he spoke to parents at the parenting workshop at York um, this Sunday. Yes, ma'am. And Ward A lot of folks are saying curbing this crime crisis involving our young people starts at home. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to know what you um, shared with those parents if you talk to them about holding their children accountable, <laughs> specifically when we're talking about um, criminalizing or changing laws and pertaining to well, thank you for that question. And I, and I tell you, yesterday, the Parenting Revival was hosted by Ronald Moulton. Um, was a very, very good revival. Um, I think we had up to 100, um, to include children, uh, males and females, parents um, alike in that setting. Um, and the intent was really to help some of those parents find solutions for how they need to address their children. Some of them have, have exhausted themselves of every single tool that they have. And the Metropolitan Police Department and I specifically, the Chief of Police, want to be a part of helping them resolve some of their issues. And I and I shared with them yesterday my, my upbringing where there were days where you know I, I didn't know where my next meal was going to come from as a child right I talked to them about some of the disparities that my mother had when it came to resources of being able to raise three children at a very young age and so knowing that these women and these men are still struggling with some of those same um, issues we want to I want to specifically be able to share with them that there are resources available to them here within the metropolitan, within the District of Columbia. The second piece was that uh, we recognize that some of our, our, our parents are dealing with mental health issues. You know, being able to connect with DBH to ensure that this is not just a one-time uh, meeting. This is going to be an ongoing meeting and we will continue to have. And we and it's my understanding from Mr. Moten is that we will take this across the District of Columbia because it does start at home. And again, I'll, I'll preface that, as I said before, that that parents are exhausted with ideas. I had a young one young lady who cried about the fact that she pleaded with the system to keep her son 
um, not necessarily behind bars, but to get him some resources um, uh, because he was just really out of control and she had no other measures in place. We have at the Metropolitan Police Department our Youth and Family Engagement Bureau where we work with at-risk kids on a regular basis and their families. And I would encourage you, um, if you haven't had the opportunity to meet Assistant Chief Wright, please reach out to him and we will do whatever we can along with some of our other DC in government entities to support our parents in this space. Okay. Um, second, second question was just about the body on cameras and some yep. of the other policy changes you um, have planned. You said the U.S. Attorney supports those changes as well. Did you get guidance from the U.S. Attorney in regards to what changes could be made to make sure cases are prosecuted? Absolutely. And one of the things that I will say, um, you know, since I've been in this space with Matt Grace, um, he and I have met, uh, if, if not biweekly, monthly. Um, to really talk about making sure that when we write our reports that they are they can prosecute and one of the hindrance in that is not being able to um, um, articulate or remember right um, what actually occurred and it's not necessarily the actual entire incident it may just be a color of a car right our officers come to work every day and they have calls waiting for them when they get to their districts um, and that's a lot of um, um, information for them to remember. Having them, um, giving them the opportunity, and this legislation will do that to review their body-worn cameras um, prior to writing their uh, final police report will certainly help and aid in prosecution of cases. Yes. Do you have Kevin vote for the council for the legislation? We will. Yep. But let's start today. Let's start today. Hold up. Hold up. You asked me a lot of questions. Let's start today. You asked me, do I have seven votes? Let's start today. You got any other questions? Yes, go ahead, Janae. Go, I'm sorry. Yep. Um, what I say is that this, this law was in place in the district from 1996 to 2014. I'll ask Deputy Mayor Pia to say more. Sure. We know that there, I'm a lawyer, right? Like, so there's no benefit in us proposing anything that isn't real or unconstitutional. Right. So certainly we've looked at that. There, you know, my, I myself looking that there are drug-free zones. The sentencing project actually has a really interesting primer on drug-free zones across the, the, the country. And certainly, I look back at the time of the 2014, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, when the council struck down the two together, and were there any challenges specifically to the anti-loitering drug-free zone? No, there aren't any that I'm aware of. There certainly were issues around prostitution-free zones, but constitutionality, whether it's in policing or any of the proposals we're making, is at the foundation of anything that we're going to put forth, and certainly a primary consideration for this lawyer. interpretation is it up to that something's constitutional because by the end of the day people have certain biases and you know when it comes to particular cases it might change based on who you talk to and you know we've seen that time and time again so so like what are the safeguards against that against certain laws being abused even if it is for safety sake I mean, so, uh, like, I can't speak generally across the board as to, uh, about constitutionality, but with regards to this provision, when you look at it, there are a number of considerations that go into the determination of how an area would be designated, the type of notice that those in the area are given or otherwise of what is allowed or not allowed. And so I think those are the type of determinations that officers make on a regular basis and that we work with attorneys, legal counsel division, and otherwise to help us to make sure that we're clear about what is and isn't constitutional policing and certainly constitutional laws. Okay, you've been waiting. Yep. Uh, hey, uh, Mayor, Deputy Mayor Pete, uh, Tom Rousey, ABC 7 News. Two questions. Uh, one, it's just kind of getting into the details deep in the legislation. It seems like there are some provisions that make it more difficult to get information, at least about officers accused of violations, so I wanted to ask about the thought process and what problem you're addressing there, and if there's concerns that it might keep the public from getting information the public should know. And, and also on the masking part, I just wanted to ask, since people would still be allowed to do it for health reasons, 
how does that work on the street? Like, would it just be an extra charge after the fact, or would it be more than that? Let me ask the deputy mayor to speak to it. Sure. So, I'm sorry. On the first, the first part, one of the things is we're committed to transparency. We recognize that there is a higher level of accountability and expectation for officers, which is why the proposal that we've put forth is that for substantiated allegations of misconduct, that that information be made available to the public, which is something that we don't do for any other district employee, right? You cannot get information about individual employee discipline. But we recognize there is a higher standard for officers. But we also recognize that there's a balance between a need for transparency and appropriate accountability for officers and some privacy rights. Officers have entitlement to due process and otherwise as well. So if there are, they have allegations that are not substantiated, we don't. Be, we believe there are some balances, and that allowing them to have privacy in those interests in those in, um, instances is still appropriate. And then I'm sorry, the other part on on masking in in um, process. This was the law until 2020, and so certainly there's a. It is not just that you know, the MPD will stop people for wearing a mask. It's a mask and, right? So someone who is wearing a mask for the purposes of engaging in a violation of a criminal or civil penalty to threaten, harass, or to cause fear, those are the type of, based upon the totality of circumstances, those are the type of determinations that MPD officers have to make a lot of time when determining when, um, how to prevent crime. And so what we're giving them now is a tool. I use this example because it's a real one. We have a nightlife task force that I met with the business owners in U Street Corridor who were asking us, listen, people are coming in with ski masks on in July. You can't do anything about that. And the answer was no. That MPD, they are committed to constitutionality. They can only enforce the law as it is. If there's no law, there's nothing for them to enforce. And so this isn't about um, getting people on an extra charge for wearing a mask. It's about preventing crime. Right? That's really what it's about. And so giving our officers the opportunity to prevent crime before it happens based upon their evaluation of a threat. So in and of itself, Delia, no, it's not a crime to walk into a store with a mask on in July. But based upon an evaluation by MPD, you often see in our lookouts or otherwise four people in ski masks walking up sidewalk or otherwise. This gives MPD the opportunity to even engage. If, if an officer saw someone approaching some, uh, walking up the sidewalk now in July with a ski mask, they have no tool to engage, even if they believe that is, based upon the totality of circumstance, a concern. So I can't say, right, like in random examples, the chief would be better or we, you know, but really it's about, okay, we want to give them the opportunity to at least break up. That's even what we're talking about with drug-free zones or otherwise. We want to interrupt the potential for criminal activity. That's the goal. This is, Janae, this is my strategy on any legislative uh, piece of, that, I, that I introduce to the council. I ask the professionals and the experts what they need, be it in fire and EMS or MPD or the Department of Human Services, and I introduce the legislation that I think will help close the gaps. In this case, the legislation that will help keep us safer. And then I work with the members of the council to get the legislation passed. Frequently, you know, people tell me uh, it won't pass. You have zero votes. And I just keep working hard every day to say to members of this community, for example, in Ward 4, who talk to me daily about their concerns about safety. They ask me frequently about wanting more police officers. And what I tell them is I can't do it alone. We have to have a policy environment that supports safe communities. We have to have a policy environment that allows us to recruit and retain officers and not lose our officers to the surrounding jurisdictions because our policy environment makes them scared to do their job. Once again today, then, I've heard Chairman Mendelson's office was not brief before that. Was Brooke Pinto's office, for example? Brooke Pinto herself was brief. And she's the chair of the committee. And so that is frequently our process. 
We talked to the chair of the committee upon introduction. Uh, we shared the legislation, you know, the, uh, my side, the mayor's side is required to get a legal sufficiency. So we also submitted it to the attorney general. And I'd like to have this introduction to the council by their November meeting. Opioids, fentanyl, um, uh, controlled substance drugs that are illegal in the District of Columbia. What about marijuana? On Kennedy Street, for instance, we prosecutors Is that illegal? Well, it's not illegal, but it's I'm illegal to be if sold. the prosecutors charge a man through of six, bringing marijuana from California, for instance, and selling it on the street. Is marijuana, the sale is sale, illegal? That's sale, sale, absolutely. Yes, sir. Is that a big concern among these markets? Well, it's a concern because you cannot sell marijuana and, and you cannot illegally sell it, you can't use it, sell it, or possess it. So in, in the spaces that we're in right now, uh, and, and to your question, uh, it is illegal and we would, we would affect an arrest in that case. Well, well, an illegal amount, not a legal amount, illegal, illegal amount. You'd be able to possess two ounces of marijuana in a drug-free zone. You don't know the answer to that. <laughs> Come on. No. No. If it's been declared a drug-free zone, then you're not going to be loitering in it or possessing or using marijuana. But I, I just want to get back to Janate's question, and maybe I'm reading a little too much in it, um, because we support... Uh, the initiative 70, what is it, 7, 77, 71, uh, that the, the people of the district passed, but it also created very dangerous gray markets in the district, which is why I also introduced legislation to allow the district to tax and regulate marijuana. Uh, the marijuana, war now Chief did say this, I'll be a little bit more colorful, is uh, it's a lot of cash in it, it's still a lot of street sales, and it's a lot of violence involved in it. Uh, so whether it's marijuana or fentanyl or pills or Percocets or whatever, these drugs are fueling violence, and they're disrupting um, peaceful communities. Okay, I'm going to wrap up my press questions. Are you a member of the press? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. I don't think there was, um, uh, certainly not from us, not from our previous police chiefs. Um, I have noted concerns throughout. Um, there was an emergency passed, and I think, and let me just say this, I think that the intentions, they, they were well-intentioned. And I think all of us following uh, the murder of George Floyd wanted to make sure that we were doing everything possible uh, to have uh, a safe in um, constitutional police force. I said at the time, our police force is not like a lot of police forces around the country, and I think some of the reforms, uh, you know, have made our communities less safe. So there, there's not to say that there weren't good pieces of that legislation, but we are addressing um, some things that we think are very important. All right, any other press questions? All right. Press question, yes. Uh, this is Peterson, ABC News. Um, can you talk a little bit about the war situation, the armed robbery that happened earlier this month? I'm just curious from you, do you see that as possibly the breaking point for the creation of the new masking law? And about the masking law, uh, do you consider that to be maybe a misdemeanor or a felony or a citation? Um, the, the incident that you're referring to have, really has nothing to do with the introduction. We've been working on it um, for a few weeks. Uh, it, with this with this more comprehensive piece. Uh, let me ask the deputy mayor to talk about the specific charge. Um, again, so it's, it's this is more, oh, I have to look at this, but I don't believe we've made it a felony. It's linked to a mask plus. So if someone's engaging in criminal conduct or 
um, has intent to threaten, harm, or harass, certainly that will be charged as well. But again, I sort of point to this because, you know, this isn't about criminalizing behavior so much as changing behavior, right? Like, so our goal is to interrupt criminal activity, and if people are engaged in other criminal conduct, that will be charged. But the, the charging decisions be are MPDs and certainly the U.S. Attorney's Office. Okay, last question. Uh, Mike, Michael? Yeah, hi, Michael from the Washington Post here. Are the members of the council still here? I'm wondering if you might be able to hear from them. You have a question? What's your question? What's your question? Did they leave? Oh, they're here. Yeah, what's your question, Michael? Yeah, I want to know what they think of the proposal <laughs> to support what she and discuss uh, hostage that they passed in 2020 and 2022 to set aside the electric bond for hostage ministry. Yeah, sure. Councilmember McDuffie? Thank you, Mayor Bowser. Um, so, Michael, I think that was your question. I'm not sure where you are. So, I don't think, I don't want to speak for my colleagues, but I have not seen the proposal. I don't think either of us have yet to review the proposal. Uh, I think it deserves an expeditious review uh, to determine what the council can agree on to be able to promote because uh, ultimately uh, I'm here and I think my colleagues are here because the violence that we're seeing right now, the crime is rampant and it's unacceptable. And so we came. Uh, as a show of support for residents who have felt like they need to see their city, uh, their mayor, their council members, and other elected officials uh, really engage in action to promote safety across the District of Columbia. So uh, the minute I have an opportunity to review uh, the mayor's proposal, I'd be happy to go on record with you about what I agree with and what I don't. Uh, but ultimately, uh, this today for me was about uh, really showing a sense of solidarity that uh, I do not accept the levels of crime that we're seeing, and the solutions um, need to come in a myriad of forms. And if there are things that we can work with the mayor on, then you should know that we're going to work with her to make sure we get that done. I would 100% agree with my colleague. It is so important for us in this city uh, to make sure as Democrats, uh, as a Democrat-led city, the Republicans in Congress are attacking us every day in our very democracy. And as a Democratic-led city, we have to stand together united. And so as my colleague said, we are standing here together united. We're also saying to our community members that we are willing, we are going to work together. It can't be the council versus the mayor versus the judges versus USAO versus AOAG. It has to be all of us united together, working together. That's the environment we have to be in, and that's the environment that we all are committed to doing. I'd just like to add a word about uh, what we are seeing today, all of us together. It is about being solid and together, unified in fighting this, what was called many years ago, this scourge that is on our city, our community. And that's why we're here. Um, it's not about whether or not a provision may have a little twist in the law, we know that we're at a point where we have got to get help. And help is not going to come from um, the land, it's going to come from us. And so together, I think we are saying today, all of us, that we're standing together against what is happening in our community, to our children, to our families. And I want to thank the mayor and the administration for being bold, because that's what this is. Being thank very you. bold. Thank, thank, you. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, and we're here, because this is our town. That's right. yeah. And we have to make it work. And that's what we're committed to doing. I don't know if we have seven votes, but we probably will. <laughs> thank you. <Yeah. laughs> I appreciate that you're all here and you, you, you can if you want to do something about Congress. But from what you've heard this morning, you know, whether it be about the use of force changes, the, the, the release of data, is there anything that you see or have heard today that is either something that you know definitely you can get behind or that you know is definitely a deal breaker for you? Mark, Mark I appreciate your question and I, and I sincerely do. 
without having seen the proposal and read specific language, if there's no way to be able to comment on what I'm going to vote for and what I'm not. What I, what I will say is that I can agree with the mayor and anybody, for that matter, who is putting forth policies designed to make our city safer, I'm willing to work with them, right? And so I'm here today because I'm showing that I'm willing to work with the mayor, I'm willing to work with these ANC commissioners, our civic association leadership, uh, with my colleagues uh, on proposals that we can agree on that are designed to keep our city safer. If it is fair and constitutional policing, then it should be on the table in terms of what we are looking at to make our city safer. We need to enhance the level of safety that is in our communities today, and I think most of us can agree on that. Yes, we do. All right. You heard it. And we're not going for seven. We're going for 13. Okay? Thank you, everybody.